Welcome to the APS seminar. Just a reminder, uh, questions will be answered at the end of the seminar. So you can type your questions into the Q&A box throughout the presentation. Or if you would like to ask a question live, hit the raise hand button and we will unmute you to ask the question. Um, so I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Matthew. So Matthew is a PhD student advised by Dr. Mary Rogers in the Horticultural Science Department. He is currently studied studying spotted wing drosophila and whether aversive odorants could be used to protect fruit crops in an integrated pest management setting. Matthew's love for plants and growing food began as a child helping his, in his parents' garden. Since then, he has continued to learn about plants and insects at Gustavus Adolphus College, where he graduated with a BA in biology. Afterwards, he worked as a research technician for the Nature Conservancy um, Ruth Shaw's research group and the Native Bee Lab at the University of Minnesota. In 2020, he received a Master's of Science degree in Applied Plant Sciences at the University of Minnesota, where he studied organic chemical and cultural controls for spotted wing drosophila. Thank you for the introduction, Liesl. And today I will be talking about the chemical ecology of spotted wing drosophila and the potential of using uh, some potential of using these olfactory stimuli to change their behavior for organic pest management systems. Throughout the course of this presentation, I'll give an introduction on fruit production in the upper Midwest to provide some context for spotted wing drosophila's host crops, and then move on to spotted wing drosophila's biology and ecology before talking about my research objectives. So to start with fruit production in the upper Midwest, in 2017, Driscoll's named the Twin Cities as the raspberry consumption capital of America. And this is because residents here consume 132% more raspberries than the average American and were number three for all berry crops combined. So here in the upper Midwest, we have a really large market for fresh berry and fruit consumption. However, Minnesota is not one of the top fruit producing states. These are California, Washington, Florida, and Oregon, with Michigan being our closest um, somewhat neighboring state at number five. Minnesota only ranks number 25 and Wisconsin as number 10 out of 50 states for fruit production. So we have a pretty low uh, fresh fruit production here in Minnesota. One way that farmers can meet local demand would be to grow longer season cultivars. Uh, the more traditional cultivars for June bearing or for strawberries here in the upper Midwest are June bearing strawberries, which are grown perennially for five to seven years before replanting and have a concentrated harvest between June and July. Uh, day neutral strawberries, on the other hand, are a more novel fruit crop, and these are grown annually, but have a longer and later harvest season where they'll fruit continuously until frost and yields can be four to five times as great as June bearing strawberries. Another way that farmers could increase demand or increase production for fruit is to grow primocane raspberries in addition to floricane. Floricane uh, raspberries are more typical for this region with a, um, these are second year canes that have a concentrated harvest between June and September compared to primocanes, which are first year canes that um, have a later harvest from August until frost kills the flowers. However, organic fruit production is still challenging in the upper Midwest, and this is due to relatively short, rainy, and humid growing seasons compared to the major fruit producing states. This allows insect pests and fungal pathogens, which have specific humidity requirements, to reach really damaging populations over the course of the growing season. Um, additionally, one possible explanation why there are so many temperate invasive insect pests is represented by this figure from Freestone et al, um, where they were looking at species richness as a function of latitude. This solid line represents the native species richness and this dashed line represents invasive species richness. 
Um, here at 45 degrees latitude, where we are in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, we tend to have relatively high invasive species to uh, native species or um, a higher invasibility because we don't have the same levels of biodiversity that are seen in the tropics that can impede um, invasive species from establishing. One of these invasive species and the focus of my research is on spotted wing drosophila. Spotted wing drosophila is an invasive polyphagous insect pest that was first detected in North America and Europe in 2008 and in South America in 2014. Um, it's a polyphagous pest, which means it has a wide host range and larvae feed on the interior of the fruit. This is the most destructive life stage for SWD. The adults use a combination of visual, olfactory, and taste cues for host selection. And um, for my research objectives, I'll be focusing on the olfactory cues. Additionally, there are multiple management strategies for SWD. And um, in order to develop a more complete integrated pest management uh, tactics for SWD, uh, management strategies should continually be assessed and um, tested. So to start with SWD's host preferences, there are more than 30 cultivated and wild hosts for SWD. In 2013, Bellamy et al. conducted a pairwise choice test of these fruit crops. And um, with the average of these pairwise choices, um, for SWD along the bottom of this table here. And they found that overall grapes were the least preferred crop for SWD with um, raspberries being the most preferred crop. However, little is known about cultivar differences within these crop species, which I'll address later. SWD is a particularly challenging pest because of the damage it causes to fruits and this is due to morphological adaptation compared to other species of Drosophila, where the adult female SWD have a sclerotized and serrated ovipositor seen here in the lower right image. Uh, this allows the adults to puncture the skin of ripe and ripening fruit that are intact and undamaged, as opposed to the um, Drosophila melanogaster or the common vinegar fly, which tends to um, only infest rotting fruit. The image on the left here shows a picture of Drosophila melanogaster ovipositing in a piece of damaged cherry skin or cherry fruit. In the center image is a picture of spotted wing Drosophila as a comparison, ovipositing in a piece of damaged cherry skin or undamaged cherry skin, where it has punctured the skin of the fruit and deposited two eggs. And then this image on the right is a picture of grape skin that SWD has punctured but unsuccessfully laid an egg in. And although there won't be any larval infestation, this still opens up the fruit to secondary infections of bacterial or fungal pathogens. Larvae then hatch from these eggs within a few hours and begin to destructively feed on the interior of the fruit. As I said earlier, this is the most destructive life stage of SWD. And while they are inside of the fruit, they're protected from insecticides and therefore cultural control programs only target the adult life stage of SWD. Populations for SWD here in Minnesota generally appear or are found in our um, monitoring traps around um, mid-June, sometimes a little bit earlier or later depending on the season. And then populations peak generally in mid-July and in September before tapering off in the fall. The populations overlap with day-neutral strawberry and primocane raspberry production, which makes berry farmers hesitant to grow these crops. Generally, June-bearing strawberries avoid the um, majority of SWD infestation because they ripen earlier than um, SWD is typically uh, present in Minnesota. Additionally, there are multiple overlapping generations for SWD, which means growers have to continually manage SWD over the course of the harvest season. There are also native insect pests, such as tarnished plant bugs seen here, 
um, that are particularly challenging to day neutral strawberry producers doing, due to their longer harvest season compared to the June bearing strawberries. A little bit on tarnish plant bugs since this um, is relevant for my second research objective. Tarnished plant bug is a polyphagous insect pest. It, its primary host crop is alfalfa. Um, however, it can be a problematic pest for strawberry growers because um, when farmers harvest their alfalfa, tarnished plant bug generally will move into strawberry fields and then feed on developing strawberry fruit, um, which results in um, these underdeveloped and aborted akenes that cause a malformed strawberry fruit, sometimes referred to as cat face strawberries, and results in unmarketable fruit at harvest. Organic controls for tarnished plant bug in strawberries are inconsistently effective, and cultural controls include vacuuming and trap cropping, um, in addition to pyrethrum sprays. However, these aren't as effective as conventional spray programs. Researchers at the University of Wisconsin-Madison have been looking at using alfalfa as a trap crop since it's the preferred host for tarnished plant bug in June bearing strawberry production. Uh, one of the main management strategies for both tarnished plant bug and um, spotted wing drosophila is chemical controls. And um, despite an emphasis on integrated pest management practices, uh, chemical control strategies still remain the most common form of control for these pests. These are generally calendar applications, usually weekly sprays throughout the harvest season, and can be either synthetic or natural products, um, depending on whether it's a conventional farm or a certified organic farm. Some consequences to these weekly spray applications are environmental concerns, particularly to pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, a lot of the insecticides that are effective against these pests are broad spectrum and therefore uh, kill a wide range of insects, not just the target pest. There are also few effective options, primarily in organic systems where for SWD, spinosad is the only consistently effective insecticide against SWD. And therefore, insecticide resistance is a major concern and has been documented in some counties in California. So there's a real need to investigate additional management strategies. Some of these additional management strategies include cultural controls, such as um, physical exclusion, cultivar selection, sanitation, et cetera. For my master's research, I studied physical exclusion as a cultural control for SWD. And our study, among others, found inconsistent efficacy at decreasing SWD infestation among these practices, particularly for physical exclusion, where um, depending on how the tunnels are installed, um, later in the season, if SWD makes it into the tunnels, they can actually be sheltered from adverse weather and have higher levels of infestation of fruit inside of the tunnels compared to the open field. So although there are numerous cultural controls for SWD, they can provide incomplete protection, can be labor intensive, and growers are concerned about the cost. So therefore, our goal is to develop spotted wing drosophila pest management strategies that decrease the use of broad spectrum insecticides, adequately manage for SWD as well as additional insect pests, increase biodiversity both through the decreased use of insecticides but also through integrating additional plant species into the agro ecosystem, and um, perhaps most importantly are things that growers are interested in adopting which would hopefully lead to increased fruit production in the upper Midwest. One possible way to meet these goals is to investigate chemical ecology of pests or how they use host cues to change their behavior in the field. And this leads me to the research portion of this seminar. So if we consider all of the species in the agricultural ecosystem, there are both beneficial and pest species and this is admittedly a very humid centered view of the ecosystem. Beneficial species can include the crop, 
a secondary crop such as cover crops or um, interplanted flowering plants, um, as well as beneficial insects. Pests can be both non-damaging and damaging depending on um, their population levels and whether or not they're exceeding the economic thresholds where um, growers will be economically affected by not um, managing the pest levels. Uh, generally, when pests reach economic thresholds, they um, begin control strategies. And these can include cultural, biological, genetic, or chemical controls. And then um, strategies within these, um, in these categories are what are referred to as the IPM toolbox or specific tactics that growers can use um, depending on their uh, specific needs. Working within this IPM framework, our first research objective is to evaluate the potential deterrent effects of essential oils on SWD. For this project, we looked at blueberries and raspberries and um, or we applied the oils to blueberries and raspberries and managed, measured their effect on SWD. In the field of IPM, chemical controls or insecticides are generally the last line of defense. And if we want to move away from chemical controls, we need to investigate other alternatives. So therefore, our second aim of this research is to develop ecological based pest management for multiple pest species. For this project, we'll be looking at um, day, or day neutral strawberries and primocane raspberries interplanted with um, sweet alyssum and alfalfa um, and measuring their effect on beneficial insects as well as the pest species SWD and tarnished plant bug. And then for our third research objective, we aim to assess SWD host suitability between five cultivars of day neutral strawberries grown in the upper Midwest. So to start with our first research objective, assessing the deterrent effect of essential oils on SWD. Botanical essential oils contain volatile organic compounds or VOCs, which give plants their unique aromas and flavors. There are, they are also known to mediate plant insect interactions and therefore could interfere with SWD's ability to locate or their preference towards host fruit. A well-documented example of using botanical essential oils for pest deterrence and repellents is um, using lemon eucalyptus oil or citronella oil to repel mosquitoes. Recently, studies have investigated similar attractants and deterrents for SWD with microbial yeast fermentation volatiles, green leaf odors, and um, fruit odors as key attractants for SWD, and um, peppermint, lavender, catnip, and other plant oils as possible deterrents in the lab. Olfactometer bioassays are used to determine insect behavior in response to odorants, where insects are able to choose between two options, a um, untreated control versus an odorant. And then um, the difference in the amount of insects that select one option over the other is, um, can then be analyzed against a hypothetical mean of zero. This figure shows that attraction cues can also depend on the physiological status of SWD, specifically uh, whether they are looking to feed or mate, they'll be more attracted to fermentation odors or leaf odors compared to if they've already mated and are looking to oviposit in fresh fruit, in which case they will be looking for fruit odors and yeast odors. These attractants have been studied to design baited traps for monitoring purposes. Our lab has used these sentry baited monitoring traps um, to look at SWD pressures in the field. And the combination of the red and black color along with a um, fermentation and vinegar volatile emitting lure in the center um, is attractive to SWD. And therefore we can um, open this up and look at SWD that have gone inside of the trap. Oppositely, there are botanical essential oils that deter rather than attract SWD. Some examples seen here are 
uh, peppermint, uh, lavender, and sweet alyssum, all of which have been shown to deter SWD in the laboratory. So for this experiment, we studied the effect on SWD infestation of applying organic botanical deterrents to fly diet, as well as a spray to half-high blueberries and primocane raspberries. Um, and we predicted that these botanical essential oils would interfere with SWD's ability to detect or their preference towards the fresh fruit. Our hypotheses included, or our first hypothesis was that SWD would have less preference for artificial diet treated with essential oils in the laboratory. And then fruit crops treated with the essential oils would have less SWD infestation in the field. To test these hypotheses, we conducted a multi-choice laboratory bioassay with the artificial diet and um, two field studies in half-high blueberries and primocane raspberries. Our treatments included lavender oil, catnip oil, Ecotrol Plus, and Sporan, both of which are commercially available um, botanical essential oil blends containing um, rosemary, geranial, and peppermint oils for Ecotrol Plus, and rosemary, clove, thyme, and peppermint oils for Sporan. Growers in Minnesota were really interested in whether or not um, these commercially available products in particular were effective against SWD. Additionally, we had spinosad as a um, organic insecticide control for comparison. For the two choice bioassay, we placed two diet vials in a 32 ounce container, one treated with 32 or one treated with 12 microliters of the essential oil on filter paper and one on treated control. We then added five male and five female flies to the 32 ounce deli container and placed them in a growth chamber for 24 hours, at which time we recorded the difference in number of SWD between the vials. For our field trials, initially starting with blueberries, this experiment took place in Northfield, Minnesota with the cultivar Polaris. Four plants in each treatment group were sprayed with the corresponding treatment. And then this layout was repeated down the row until there were three replicates for each treatment. Green fruit clusters were covered with organza mesh bags prior to spraying. And this was to exclude SWD um, before we applied the treatments. Our treatments are seen in this table here in the bottom. And immediately before spraying then, the bags were removed and plants were sprayed at the maximum label rate at sunrise. 48 hours later, the previously bagged fruit were placed in incubation cups for determining infestation, and then the plants were harvested to measure yield. For raspberries, this experiment took place at Rosemount, Minnesota with the cultivar Heritage. Immediately before spraying, five store-bought organic fruit were placed in the canopy, and we used sentinel store-bought fruit in order to minimize previous SWD exposure. One of the benefits of using store-bought fruit is that prior to placing it in the field, we can look at it in the laboratory and then correct for any previous SWD eggs that are present in the fruit. Um, plants were then sprayed at the maximum label rate at sunrise, and then 24 hours later, fruit were placed in incubation cups for determining infestation. For our results with the two-choice bioassay. This is again the difference in amount of SWD between the treatment and control. We analyzed the data with one-way ANOVA and the model is also weighted to account for flies that didn't choose either vial. Our botanical products are seen along the x-axis and then um, the difference in number of SWD between the treatment and control are on the y-axis. Data points above the zero line here uh, mean that there were fewer flies in the treatment vial than the control, suggesting that the essential oil treatment had um, a non-preference effect on SWD. Our results from the one-way ANOVA showed that essential oils deterred SWD in the laboratory when we compared it against a control that um, didn't contain essential oil in either um, vial. And um, there were no significant differences between the essential oils. 
For our field trial results, this time we used a two-way ANOVA analysis where we included harvest date as a factor in, um, in addition to the treatments. Um, during the first three harvests, there were significantly less SWD infestation compared to the final two harvests for blueberries. Additionally, as, or additionally, Ecotrol had marginally less infestation compared to Sporan, but not less than um, the control. And this is um, something that we've noticed in preliminary studies with blueberries in the past. Uh, Ecotrol for our raspberry field trial also had significantly less infestation for raspberries compared to um, other treatments when harvest week was included as a factor in the two-way ANOVA analysis. So some future work from these studies as well as some conclusions are that essential oils show some promise as an additional SWD management strategy. However, they may not provide adequate control on their own. Therefore, in the future, we plan to investigate dose response of VOCs. Uh, this figure from Rankema et al shows um, dose response for peppermint oils by SWD, looking at the repellency index on the y-axis here as a function of concentration. Um, and looking at the dose response is important to determine the minimum amounts needed to have a um, biologically meaningful or a behavioral effect in the field. Additionally, residual activity is important to study in the future to determine um, how long these products are effective in the field, as well as any off flavors that might be imparted to the fruit and um, would be not preferred by humans. So this study by Bedini et al. in 2020 was looking at um, tea tree oil as a possible fumigant for fresh fruit after it's been harvested to deter SWD from laying in harvested fruit. And a panel, a panel of um, professional tasters um, determined that it shouldn't be used because um, the fruit was not suitable for human consumption. It just didn't taste right. Um, and then one of the biggest questions is how to apply these essential oils in the field so that they remain effective for a long enough time that it'll be worthwhile for farmers to um, apply them. This leads me to my second research objective, which is to develop ecological-based pest management for SWD, as well as tarnished plant bug, or how we could integrate some of these deterrents in the field. Push-pull management is an ecosystem-scale behavioral-based pest management strategy that uses aversive stimuli interspersed within the crop the main crop to um, push the pest out of the main crop. And then it's coupled with an attractive stimuli outside of the primary crop to pull the pest to a specific area that can then be treated separately. This has been studied to control stem borers in corn in Sub-Saharan Africa, among other cropping systems. However, Cook et al. suggests that the application of push-pull may provide the most benefit for high value horticultural crops. The integration of these plants could lead to um, a reduced number of sprays, provide resources for pollinators if these um, attractant or deterrent plants are flowering for long periods of time, as well as managing multiple pests. And this could be either through tra trapping the insect pests if the, um, if the integrated plant is more attractive than the cultivated crop, um, it could reduce the attractiveness of the fruit crop if this um, potentially deterrent plant is interspersed throughout the main crop, um, and then also increase populations of predators and parasitoids by providing habitat and um, floral resources for um, potential biocontrol agents. This study conducted in Florida from the previous picture investigated the use of sweet alyssum border rose to support predatory aureus seen here in the upper right um, to decrease thrips population seen next to the aureus. 
the plots with Suedalism had an earlier and greater um, had an earlier and greater population of aureus compared to the strawberry plots without the Suedalism border, as well as um, having lower overall levels of thrips pests. Researchers were also interested in whether Suedalism had any effect on SWD in the laboratory and um, traps with Suedalism flower voltols had significantly assessed significantly less SWD compared to the controls. Uh, for our objectives and hypotheses, we were interested in whether we could integrate some of the sweet alyssum in the field to manage for SWD. Uh, our hypotheses are um, that sweet or strawberries interplanted with sweet alyssum and alfalfa will have less SWD infestation and tarnished plant bug damage. The presence and abundance of pollinators and beneficial insects will differ between treatments. And our third hypothesis is that fall bearing raspberries interplanted with sweet alyssum will have less SWD infestation. For this project, we will investigate two fruit crops, strawberry, strawberries, um, particularly day neutral strawberries, since they're more susceptible to SWD here in the upper Midwest, as well as primocane raspberries. We will investigate two pest species, spotted wing drosophila and tarnished plant bug, and two intercropped plant species, sweet alyssum and alfalfa. For our strawberry methods, this experiment will take place at the Minnesota Agricultural Experiment Station um, in a randomized flip block design. We will have three treatments, a control with just day neutral strawberries, for um, then we'll also have a sweet alyssum treatment interplanted with day neutral strawberries, as well as an alfalfa treatment interplanted with day neutral strawberries. Um, the movement of the potential volatiles in the field is a concern both for measuring the effects of the volatiles and for ensuring that the treatments are independent. And we decided on 10 meter spacing between the plots based on previous push pull research from Dr. Greg Loeb's research group at the university or at Cornell University. Uh, Wallingford et al was able to detect differences between treatments with five meter spacing. And so just to be safe and to optimize our field plot size, we chose to go with 10 meter spacing. For our measurements, we will harvest fruit twice weekly and record yield, um, as well as measuring SWD and tarnished plant bug damage at the time of harvest um, through visual inspection, lab incubation, as well as quantitative real-time PCR. A secondary objective of this research is to develop a high throughput infestation assessment using quantitative real-time PCR and established markers for SWD. Um, so that it doesn't take us so long just to count the eggs in um, the fruit. Insect abundance and diversity will be sampled weekly with sweep net collections, as well as clear sticky cards within the fruit or within the plots. And this is to have both an active and passive sampling and to determine the effect on beneficial insects. Um, Finally, field presence of VOCs will be measured with solid phase micro extraction tubes and subsequent GCMS analysis to observe the range of the volatiles. For our analysis, we will conduct generalized linear mixed effect models as well as one-way and two-way ANOVAs with the appropriate post hoc tests. For raspberries, this experiment will also take place at the Minnesota Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, this time with a randomized complete block design. And um, I want to note that the treatments are much closer together, or the plots are much closer together in this experiment at 10 feet or only three meters apart. And this is because raspberries take a couple years to establish, and this is in an established raspberry plot um, that was previously planted for a separate experiment. However, we'll still be conducting the um, GCMS analysis to determine um, field presence of the volatiles. Our treatments will include a control, um, sweet alyssum interplanted with 
um, primocaine raspberries as a test of a um, aversive stimuli. Um, our third treatment will be sweet alyssum interplanted with day neutral or with primocaine raspberries, as well as having baited monitoring traps as a test of um, both a aversive and attractive stimuli in a push pull setting. And then um, our final treatment will be primocaine raspberries with baited monitoring traps as a test of a pull or attractive stimuli. Again, we will measure yield, SWD infestation, insect abundance and diversity, and the field presence of VOCs in a similar way to how we um, conducted our measurements for day neutral strawberries. And for our analysis, we will use generalized linear mixed effect models as well as one way and two way ANOVAs with the appropriate post hoc tests. So in summary, for objective two, we aim to develop season long ecological based pest management for multiple pest species, tarnished plant bug, as well as spotted wing drosophila with the aim of supporting beneficial insects such as predators and pollinators. We also hope to decrease the number of sprays required for managing these insect pests and thereby mitigating any insecticide resistance concerns. Hopefully um, by integrating flowering plants within the agro ecosystem, this overall would hopefully decrease the cost of managing these pests so that growers don't have to um, continually spray on a weekly basis. For our third research objective, we aim to look at SWD plus suitability between fruit cultivars. So if we return to this, figure from previously in the presentation, um, there's a general um, spectrum of SWD preference between fruit crops with um, grapes again being the least preferred and um, strawberry or with raspberries being the most preferred fruit crop. However, few studies report host suitability differences within a single variety, or I mean within multiple varieties for a single fruit crop. Um, a few exceptions to this are um, studies that have looked at cold hardy grapes, blueberries, as well as tart cherries. Timing is really important for SWD susceptibility in these fruit crops um, with early ripening cultivars um, being able to avoid the majority of SWD infestation. This study by Hampton et al. at Michigan State University investigated earlier ripening cultivars of blueberries and found blueberries ripening before the end of July were generally uninfested by SWD compared to later season blueberry varieties that tended to be much more infested. Um, and although it would be great to just recommend to growers, if you plant early ripening varieties of fruits or um, just June bearing strawberries, you'll um, not have to deal with SWD. This severely limits fruit production. And if we wanna increase fruit production here in the upper Midwest, um, we need ways around um, just uh, phenology based um, cultivar selection options. Our lab has done a little bit of work looking at host preference in cultivars of um, cold hardy blueberries, where we exposed these five cultivars, Chippewa, North Blue, Northland, Patriot, and Polaris um, individually to SWD in tests of no choice over position. Um, we also um, introduced SWD to two cultivars at a time in a two choice over position pairwise choice test. And then um, we also measured uh, um, adult emergence from these eggs. We then put um, these parameters in a model developed by Bellamy et al. and modified for our research objectives where we could um, independently weight each of these parameters so that we could um, have a, a broader range of the host, average host potential index. Um, we then conducted a 30 iteration bootstrap analysis based on the average host potential index and found that Chippewa was the most preferred 
um, blueberry cultivar by SWD based on these parameters, and Northland was the least preferred. Additionally, oviposition was negatively correlated with fruit firmness, and survivorship was positively correlated with acidity. The chemical composition of fruit may also influence SWD preference and performance. This study by Breaker et al. out of Germany was looking at mapping populations of um, strawberry varieties um, with various species of Fragaria represented. They found that this one accession, number 300, or Gross Oppelsdorf, had a high level of methyl anthranilate that was attractive to SWD, but also any eggs that were laid in um, this cultivar had lower levels of, or um, had much lower emergence compared to the other cultivars, um, showing that there were different, or uh, accessions, I mean. Um, showing that there are differences between these accessions based on the methyl anthranilate, and there could be some sort of ovicidal effect going on with this chemical in particular. For our hypotheses, we're interested in testing um, first that SWD oviposition development feeding choices will vary among strawberry cultivars grown in the upper Midwest and that physical and chemical differences within strawberry fruit will correlate to SWD with selection and preferences. For our methods, we will grow five day neutral strawberry cultivars in the greenhouse and cultivars will include Albion, EV2, Monterey, Portola, and Seascape. We're also interested in growing woodland strawberry, Fragaria vesca, um, which um, the Gross Obeldorf 300 accession from the Breaker study um, belong to, as well as other varieties as um, space and resources allow. Fruit will be harvested in the morning and placed in eight ounce um, plastic deli cups and a subsample of fruit will be used for gas chromatography mass spectrometry analysis. And um, we will measure fruit quality parameters um, as well as SWD oviposition, larval survival, and feeding preferences. Data will be analyzed with one-way ANOVA to determine differences in fruit quality parameters as well as SWD preference, and we will use uh, generalized linear models to analyze any possible um, correlations between fruit quality and chemistry with SWD susceptibility. Finally, we hope to develop a host potential index similar to the one for blueberries to determine relative preferences of strawberry cultivars to SWD. Some anticipated outcomes of the study are that cultivar differences for SWD preference over position and survivorship will vary, or there will be cultivar differences for SWD preference over position and survivorship. Um, so similar to the um, previous figure with the um, blueberry cultivars, we just don't know what the case is for day neutral strawberries yet. So um, we're interested to see this and potentially make cultivar recommendations for growers based on the susceptibility of these day neutral strawberry crops um, to SWD. However, before we can make any recommendations to growers, further research under field conditions would be needed for validation. So in conclusion, botanical deterrence in the form of applied essential oils or fragrant interplanted crops may provide SWD management services as well as limit insecticide concerns to beneficial insects. However, before push-pull can be fully developed, further understanding about how SWD responds to attractive and aversive volatiles in the field is required. Additionally, botanical deterrence may provide incomplete protection against SWD, but even a reduction in pest pressures would be beneficial to growers, particularly towards developing IPM strategies for this pest. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my committee members, Drs. Mary Rogers, Adrian Higeman, Emily Hoover, Justin Rankema, and Bill Hutchinson, as well as members of the Rogers, Hageman, and Hutchinson labs who have been um, so supportive. 
as well as the West Central Research and Outreach Center staff, in particular, Steve Poppy for answering all of the questions I've had about fruit production as um, in particular, day neutral strawberries. He's just so smart and um, knows a lot about day neutral strawberry production. Um, I'd also like to thank funding for these projects provided by the USDA North Central SARE, as well as the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plant and Pest Center. And with that, I will take any questions. Matt, there is a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, let's see, John asks, would it be possible or practical to fill out the seasonal supply of fresh berries in Minnesota by bringing more berry species into widespread production, in particular, mulberries, blueberries, cranberries, and ground cherries seem like promising candidates? Yes, um, the answer to that is yes. And there is research being done here at the university. Um, the one particular, or the research in particular that comes to mind is um, developing kiwi berries as a fruit crop here in Minnesota. Um, that has been um, somewhat slowly, but um, beginning to gain more widespread knowledge. And um, Seth Wanamuller is a great person to ask about um, some of this kiwi berry research. Um, I believe there's also a um, some interest in developing amelanchier species or service berries for um, fruit production. Um, and um, yeah, the, I think um, something that's really cool about doing fruit research in Minnesota is just how kind of novel it is and people looking for new fruit crops all of the time, particularly cold hardy fruit crops. And just a reminder, if you have any other questions, um, you can put them in the Q&A box. Matthew, this is uh, Don. Could you say a little bit more about your objective one? As we talked uh, during your dry run, you know, you basically selected, you know, four or five potential essential oils. Could you say a little bit more about that, um, the potential for investigation, additional essential oils? Uh, yeah. in, in, in your program or in your lab over, over the next number of years? Yeah, um, so the reason we chose a pretty restricted range of essential oils is, um, first off, we were interested in what growers were interested in applying. So that's why we were looking at the essential oil brand, blends and the commercially available products. Uh, we are also interested in um, looking at products that are already wide, widely produced and wouldn't be so economically um, uh, outrageous to purchase at bulk concentrations for growers, um, like the lavender oil, which is pretty widely produced already. Um, and also just um, looking to confirm other studies, particularly with the um, Nepeta and catnip oil. Um, there was a study out of Germany that had, um, that showed that some uh, catnip had iridoid compounds that mimicked uh, parasitoid wasp pheromones and SWD would potentially avoid laying eggs in fruit treated with those iridoid compounds because it um, possibly thought that there were parasitoids around, um, which is a really kind of interesting uh, plant parasitoid um, similarity. But um, yeah, it was a pretty small um, amount of essential oils that we have tested so far. We are 
definitely interested in looking at further essential oils, um, particularly um, going back to the kiwi berry research, there are some iridoid compounds that are potentially better candidates and better matches to the parasitoid wasp. Um, and we are working with Seth Wanamuller to um, potentially distill some of those iridoid compounds um, in, uh, in Adrian Hegeman's lab and then um, apply them in the field. So um, we are still looking at additional essential oils. Um, this is really just, you know, a first start to uh, the research. Um, and I see there are additional questions coming in. Matt Clark at, says methylanthranilate is used as a bird repellent. Have you considered using it as a treatment for SWD control in addition to your essential oils? Uh, yes. Um, and I believe Adrian's lab has um, some standards of methylanthranilate, and I'm definitely interested in testing it both in the laboratory as well as in the field. Um, it, it, the breaker study showed that it's a possible attractant, so I'm not sure you would want to apply it in the field um, unless it was in a um, specific area that you wanted to draw SWD towards. Um, so yeah, it, it, uh, methylanthranilate has been a uh, um, something that we are interested in looking at more, as well as um, potentially identifying some uh, local strawberry accessions that have high levels of methylanthranilate. Um, it looks like uh, Cindy Tong has a question. How do the essential oils affect pollinators and beneficial insects? And that's a great question and we don't really um, know the answer to that yet. Uh, one study, the Wallingford et al. 2018 study that was looking at using um, one octin three all, which is a, um, has like a mushroom. Um, it's a constituent of um, like mushroom or it's a constituent oil that has kind of a mushroomy aroma. Um, and they were applying it to the field in uh, raspberries and they measured the effect on pollinators and beneficial insects and didn't see a significant increase or decrease um, by applying the actual essential oil. Um, so um, that's one of the reasons we are um, really interested in sampling for these um, this summer. And then uh, Bill Hutchinson says, could you explain more about how alfalfa is to be used with strawberry? Is the plan to use this to pull plant bugs away from the strawberry? Um, and yes, uh, that's what uh, Gudeau's lab has been seeing with June bearing strawberries, um, where the alfalfa actually um, is more attractive to the tarnished plant bug. And um, as a preferred host plant for tarnished plant bug, the idea is that it'll um, uh, keep more of the tarnished plant bug in that specific area rather than in the strawberry plants. Now, um, since Day neutral strawberries have a longer harvest season. I am interested to see if having alfalfa next to the strawberry plants potentially builds up the tarnished plant bug population to such an extent that it spills over into the raspberry plots, but um, that is something that we are interested in um, analyzing and testing. Uh, and then as a follow-up, Bill asks, do we have established alfalfa available for this now? And um, we don't have established alfalfa in the plot since we are gonna have to um, shape the beds and plant these day neutral strawberries in a um, in a annual growing system. And so the idea is to um, 
either plant some alfalfa in the greenhouse just to get it started and then transplant it into the field or to um, plant the alfalfa in the plots at fairly high seeding densities in order to um, get it to germinate and start growing um, by the time that there are strawberries in the field.